official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official Yeah, no, the sniper's on the roof And then like, I was late And like the cops like mouthing off to me And I'm like I didn't know. All right, sorry. Um, all right, there's a lot to cover today. Uh, this is going to be a big sort of brain dump of a bunch of different data structures you guys should know about in the context of databases. Uh, so let, let's get as much as we can. So again, for the class, uh, project one, again, is due this Sunday. There's a recitation and the uh, tutorial how to, how to profile the performance of your system. That's posted on Piazza, and the video is available. As I said, beginning of the semester, the, we have extra office hours this Saturday, or the day before any project is due, uh, and that'll be in Gates 5207, and you'll sign up using the, the OHQ uh, website, right? I think I point out too a reminder. As I said, beginning of the semester, do not email individual TAs about like how to debug your project. Please either come to office hours or post everything on Piazza, right? Because instead of explaining the same thing over and over again to different people. We want if we post on Piazza, then, then everyone else can can see, uh, you know, can, can see what the solution is, how to fix things. Homework three will be uh, out today, and then I'll be due on the actually October six, not September six. Sorry, so not 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 in the past, in the future. And then uh, the midterm again will be in in three weeks coming up in class. So again, if you're uh, if you haven't started on project one, uh, you start now, right? right? If you're struggling with with, with what a deadlock is. This is going to be a problem because project two is going to be much harder than project one. So if you don't know what, what a deadlock is now, and you don't have to debug a multi-threaded C++ program, you're going to have a lot of problems later on. So if you haven't started now, please start. And then if you have questions, obviously don't show up on Saturday's office hours and be like, hey, how do I get started? You're going to have problems, OK? All right, so last class, we were making distinction about talking about indexes in the context of B plus trees. Uh, and we sort of said that there's these notion of an index which is, is the data structure we're going to maintain in our database system that, that, that allows us to find the location of a given tuple or record based on some number of attributes, right? certain number of columns, and so forth. Right? And the B plus tree is, is the most widely used one. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about filters, because uh, this is going to be an important data structure that's going to allow us to do a bunch of other optimizations later on, especially when we talk about joins. And, and similar to how the mod law keeps appearing in different contexts in the database system, uh, a filter is going to be useful in a, different, a bunch of contexts as well. So the difference between a filter and an index is a filter can tell you whether something exists, like does a key exist in a set, but it can't tell you where it is. Index will say, yes, it's in the set, and oh, by the way, here's where to go find it. So a lot to cover today, as I said. So we'll start off just talking about balloon filters and a little bit about other filters that are out there. And then this is going to be, again, a smorgasbord of a bunch of different data structures that are super useful and widely used in database systems. Again, not B plus three is going to be the most common, but we'll see how tries and uh, skip lists are used in other contexts as well. And then we'll have a flash talk from the, the co-founder of TidyB. I think he's the, the CTO, uh, who was here last week and gave the talk uh, when we had our on-campus event. Okay? So actually, quick show of hands. Who here has heard of a balloon filter before? Half. Okay. Who here has heard of a try before? All right. Well, okay. Skip lists. Anybody? Very few. And then vector indexes and vertical indexes. Well, you know, there isn't one data structure we can point out and say that's what it is, the same way like a tri or radix tree is, but we'll cover that. All right, so balloon filters are super useful, not just for databases, but database is the most important thing, but you get, you'll see these throughout, uh, throughout other aspects of, of computing. So a balloon filter is going to be a probabilistic data structure that is going to answer, again, set membership queries, because it's a filter. It can tell you whether something exists in a set or not. But the key thing about it is that it's probabilistic. Meaning, unlike in a B plus tree, which was always give you an exact answer, like you say, does this key exist? You follow the the, the, the inner nodes, leaf nodes down, sorry, inner nodes down the pointers to the leaf nodes, and then the key either is there or not there. In a Bloom filter, uh, you'll never have false negatives. Meaning, if you ask whether a key exists, it, it will definitively say yes, it does not exist. But it may give you false positives on on keys, meaning it will tell you that it exists when it doesn't actually exist. And then it's up for you to go figure out, you know, look at the real data, depending on whether you care you know, whether that, you know, the answer is correct or not. You have to go then look up the real data to see whether that's true. All right? So, you, so an example would be, we saw this when we talked about chain hash table. In my bucket list, I could have a bloom filter in the, the, the bucket pointer array. So when I hash a key, I land, in the, I land in that bucket pointer. 
I checked the bloom filter based on that key to see whether my key could even exist in the chain. And it might tell me yes, and I go scan it and I find nothing, but if it def definitely doesn't exist, then I know it's not in my chain. All right, so that's an example where we can use this to optimize other things. So bloom filter is going to have two operations or two commands that you, you can do on it. You can insert a record, and then you can look up a, a record. You can't do deletes. We'll see accounting bloom filter in a second. That, that'll handle deletes, but in, in the, the original bloom filter, idea and how's what most widely used, you can't delete keys. And you'll see why in a second. I think Bloom filter dates back to the 1970s. It's called Bloom because the guy's name was Bloom. That's why you'll see it with a capital B because it's a, it's a proper noun. All right, so at its core, Bloom filter is just going to be a bitmap. All right, my, my toy example here, I'm showing eight, eight bits. Uh, and some, you know, typically, it'll be much larger, uh, but, but not, not significantly larger. And obviously, there's a trade-off between how big your bitmap is and how many hash, hashes you want to do into it. That'll affect the false positive rate. All right, so if I want to populate this thing, in the beginning, everything's all zeros. So I, I say I want to insert the key RZA. So in this example here, I'll have two hash functions, right? And it could be the same hash algorithm, like, like XX hash, just with different seeds, so that produces different random values. But it doesn't matter. So I'll get a hash value modified by the number of bits that I have, and then whatever number comes out of that is going to correspond to the offset in my bitmap where I'm going to flip the bit from 0 to 1. Right? If it's already 1, then I'll just leave it there. Say now I want to insert a, uh, another key, JZA. Right? Same thing, hash it twice, mod by number of bits. I get two locations, and I flip the bits. Right? So going back here, actually, from this case here, I always land it in locations where the bits were always 0, so I always flip it to, uh, from 0 to 1. And then say now we want to do a lookup on RZA. It's just the reverse of an insert. Right? It's a pretty easy algorithm. Hash it again, mod by the number of bits. I land in my location. And then as long as both bits that I land on are set to 1, then I know that this thing potentially exists in my, in my, uh, in my, my, my set. Right? If one of those bits were set to 0, then I wouldn't have it inserted it, because I would have, otherwise I would have set it to 1. Now we do lookup on Raekwon the chef, right? Same thing, hash it, get different locations, do a lookup. In this case here, the, the, the first hash gives us at um, offset 5. That's set to 0, right? The second offset is, is at 3 is 1. So again, even though one of them is set to 1, the other one's set to 0. So I know that this is, this is, uh, this is not my set. Again, this is why you can, get, can guarantee that there's no false negatives. But, but now if I do a lookup on ODB, rest in peace, uh, same thing, when I hash it, I land locations. Now I have to, happen to hash the locations where the bits are set to 1. So this response is going to come back with true, but again, in my toy example, I didn't insert it. Right? So is this clear? Again, you can imagine like, if you have a bigger, bigger, bigger bitmap and more hashes, your, the accuracy of, of these lookups will, will, will increase. But again, there's a trade-off between having a larger bloom filter. Right, and spending more compute time hashing things. So, as I said before, in this, the, the basic bloom filter, you can't delete things. Right? You can only insert and do lookups. There's a variant called a counting bloom filter, where instead of storing the bit, uh, you know, sorry, a single bit at every offset, I'll just store an integer. And every time now I hash, and do, when I do an insert, and land in my bitmap, or my, my, my vector, I'll just increase the counter by, by one. And then now I can actually do deletes as well, because now I can go and uh, when I want to delete something, I just one. Yes? Isn't the caller responsibility in that delete something that was never inserted? Uh, your, your statement is it would be the caller responsibility to, to make sure they don't delete something that was never inserted? Right. Yes. But like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> right? But they, they, again, this is something to be internal to the system. We're not writing. We can write bad code, but we're not writing explicitly malicious code to, to, to mess ourselves up. All right? So again, same thing. I'll get, uh, I, I'll get, a, you know, I'll get, I, I could never get false negatives, right? Because the counter is set to zero. I know it could not, in any of the positions, it's not set to, set to it could not exist. Uh, but I still could get false positives, or I could count something that more that, than it actually exists. A better variant is, is called uh, cuckoo filters. Uh, and the idea here is very similar to the cuckoo hash table that we talked about a few, few, few uh, classes ago, 
where, but instead of storing like the full key that we want to put into, uh, as we put in our, in our hash table, we're actually going to store what's called a fingerprint. Sort of thing, it's like a hash, but it's, it's a way to reduce the, the number of bits we have to do to uniquely represent something, uh, you know, a, a given key. So the advantage of this is that versus using a hash, it's like this is potentially cheaper to compute, and there's still, because it's not sort of randomly permuting the bits in the way a hash function does, there's still some resemblance to what the original key was. And that means that things that are close together will potentially overlap in a way that you can't do with just regular hashing. So again, like before, in, in the counting mode filter, you can do adding and you can do removing because it's just removing things out of, in and out of this hash table. And the last one is a, a different data structure called a succinct range filter, which is it's a, it'd be a very compact version of, as, of a try that we'll see later on. Um, this one is actually immutable, unlike the other two, meaning I, I have to have all the keys ahead of time, and then uh, the data structure is essentially frozen. But this is going to allow me to do the, the same you know, exact match key lookups, like does this key exist or not. But now I can also do range filter and say, does a key exist in this range? Can we think of an example of one of the, the uh, components we were talking about before in this class where I, would have, I could have all the keys ahead of time and write something once and only once and never have to modify it again? The log structure merchant, yes. Yeah. So when we wrote out that SS table, uh, Right, you could you could you have all the keys. You're doing this compaction, so you could build this this uh, this range filter now, or at, at the moment you're doing the compaction, and then write it out once and read it a bunch of different times. So the these two things were actually invented here at CMU, right? So the cuckoo filter was invented by by Dave Anderson, uh, and then the the surf, the succinct range filter, that was a, done by a PhD student that was that was co-advised by myself and, and Dave Anderson, right? Uh, and so his exact example, this is what we originally built the surf for. We put, we put it on RocksDB, right? Instead of they built a bloom filter and their SS tables, we put, in, we put in surf. And then we saw the amount of bureaucracy you have to go through to get something merged by Facebook, and we decided not to pursue it further, but uh, the code is there, all right? The Kuga filter is widely used in a bunch of different locations. And actually, if you use Redis, Redis will give you explicitly uh, a Kuga filter type, right? You can call a command and say the... the for a key value pair, the value is going to be uh, a cuckoo filter. All right, so again, filters are super useful. And again, we'll see them over and again throughout, the, throughout the, the, uh, the semester. All right, so let's switch back over and now talk about indexes. So last class, we sort of showed the B plus tree. And we showed all the, the inner nodes and the root, all the scaffolding above the, the leaf nodes. But when I removed the leaf nodes, sorry, when, when I removed all the inner nodes and kept the leaf nodes, it was essentially a linked list, right? So that's the, a linked list is the easiest way to build a, uh, an order-preserving uh, data structure, right, that you, you want it to be dynamic, meaning I want to be able to insert something into to different random locations at different times, right? And as we said before, if without the things up above, then it's always going to be uh, a linear scan across every single entry, or O, o of n, right, because i got to keep scanning until I find the th thing that I want. Now, you could, do, uh, you could do binary search that cuts things down, but the problem with if it's a linked list, you don't know where to jump into, right? Because you can't assume that the bits are all packed, or right? the values are all packed in a single array. All right, so what's one way we could speed this thing up? Well, we saw in the case of the B plus tree, we sort of built these nodes above this that had these separators to tell us when, when to go left and right. Well, what's, uh, something even more simple would be, what if we just had another level of of a linked list up above the, the bottom linked list where it just skipped every other key, right? And we can do it again on another level above. Now it skips every other key over the, the, the list below it. So now when I want to do a lookup, right, I can start here at the top, figure out what this thing is pointing to, and it, given the key that I'm looking for, if it's, if it's less than what I'm pointing at, then I know I don't want to go this way. I want to go down. And then now to do the same to look across there. Pretty basic, right? This is what a skip list is, right? It's just having these multi levels of a of a linked list with these extra pointers that allow you to jump to different offsets into the linked list that's at the bottom. And what's going to be different than what the example I showed before is that it's going to be a probabilistic data structure, meaning 
uh, you're not always going to have the, 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 the higher levels skip the same number of keys. You're essentially going to flip a coin every single time you insert something and decide you know, how, how many things you should be jumping. I'll show that in the next slide. So in general, every, every level is going to have half the keys uh, than the one below it, right? Because the probability that you're going to have a, a link at a given level uh, decreases as, as you go up, right, from, from the bottom to the top. So like a B plus tree, it's going to give us log n search times, but it's going to be pro approximate. Right? On average, it's going to be log n, but there's no guarantee because, again, we're going to, be, we're going to have some bit of randomness to it. So skip lists are going to be widely used for in-memory data structures. So just going back to my example here, right? I'm showing this on PowerPoint. But you can essentially think of this, this existing in memory. So we're not really even talking about pages anymore because this thing's not going to be spilled to disk. We're going to assume that this is sitting in the heap of, of your process. Right? And for in-memory stuff, it's, it's, it's pretty fast. So this is used a lot of times for the mem table in the log structure merge tree. Like in RocksDB, the mem table we talked about is going to be a skip list. In Wire Tiger, which is the underlying engine for MongoDB, because uh, they, they had MMAP, that was a disaster. They got rid of that, bought Wire Tiger. Wire Tiger had a log structure merge tree, again, using an in memory uh, skip list. Couchbase also uses this for in memory indexes. Single Store originally started off as MemSQL, and that was an in memory, uh, in -memory database, or at least originally it was. And those guys saw the things that Microsoft was doing, this other project called Hecaton. Uh, and they were all in with skip lists at Microsoft. The guys saw the, the, those talks, then went off and did, did MemSQL and, and borrowed the ideas, and they built their entire system around skip lists. But then they missed the later talks from Microsoft that said skip lists are a bad idea. Uh, but they, they were still riding with it for a long time. All right, so skip lists are, are they're, they're newer than a B plus tree, right? From, like from 1990, invented at the University of Maryland. And again, they mostly appear for in-memory data structures. There, there are some attempts to make them disk-based. All right, so let's, let's, let's go through a quick example. So we got through the different pieces we have. So here we have the levels, right? And the, basically, these are, these are the entry points into the data structure at a different level. And then below it, you have the probability that a key is going to exist at this level. So at the lowest level, you have to have all the keys because you have to know that you know, they have to exist in there. So the probability is n. But then above it, it's n, n divided by 2, and n divided by 4, and so forth going up. Right? And so this bottom layer here, that's equivalent to the leaf nodes we saw in the B plus tree, again, where it's in sorted order and has all the keys that could possibly exist in, in, your, in your table or your set. Right? And then this one here, now you see have, we have the entry point into at this given level. And then instead of immediately pointing to K1, it's going to point over here to K2. Right? And K2 is going to have a, a downward pointer to go back down to the level below me, right, where K2 is, but also has a pointer to go across and jump to, to the next entry. Yes? A P is like probability. Why is it uh, I, yeah, so it's, it's, it, yeah, it's the count, yes. Or on average, it's the count, yes. Yes. Yeah, divide by 100. OK. All right, so if I want to insert a K, K5, so what I got to do now, I'm basically going to flip a coin, uh, you know, a, a, a uniform random value of like 0, 1. And multiple times. And every time I get a 1, then I'm allowed to have an entry at the, the next level. And then I flip the coin again. If I get another 1, I can have an entry at the next level. If I get a 0, then I stop wherever I'm at, and I, and I have my, uh, I, I, that's where I then have my levels going across. All right, so in this case here, I flip the coin. Say I get a 1, then I'm allowed to go up here. Flip the coin again, I get a 1. Now I flip a coin here. Now I get a 0. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. And then now I got to put my entry into here. So k. So as I scan across, I say this thing is pointing at to infinity. So I got to. I got to. I know my entry should go at the very top in between the starting and the endpoint right there, right? So I would add my entry below, and then I have to trace along here to know that I come after k k four, come after k four there, right? So before I do anything, when I just set up the data structure, these things are still pointing to wherever they were pointing before. So any, anybody that's coming along at the same time I am, they're still going to follow the pointers and not see my data. Right? So now I've got to start adding the pointers from the, from the bottom to the top, because I don't want someone to come across, see that, that there's an entry at a higher level, then try to go down looking for that key, and they end up finding nothing. So when I build this thing, I'm building from the bottom to the top. Right? So again, I have all my pointers going down. 
So I add, I add the K5 to the K6. And these guys here, they're actually pointing to nothing at this point. Uh, so they, they just point to the end there. And then now I flip this pointer here. Now anybody coming along, they may not be able to use the, the pointer to get down more quickly to where I am, but they'll at least find me right, if they come along in any other level there. Flip the pointer for the next level, flip, and then flip the pointer for the next level, and then now my key is fully integrated in the data structure. So we don't do splits and merges like we did in the B plus tree. It's just finding where we need to be in the, in, in the, the linked list and then inserting ourselves. And we can do a little tricks to, to, to just do essentially a compare and swap in memory to replace these pointers and not have to take latches on anything. So if you have the linked list only going in one direction, then you can do this in a, in a lock-free manner or a latch-free manner. Like you just, compare, you just do compare and swap. All right, so now if I, want, if I want to find a value. So again, I, now I start at the top level, and I can scan across and figure out what I'm pointing at from the entry point. So in this case here, I scan across, I find K5. K3 is less than K5, so I know that the thing I'm looking for is not going to be after this K5 here, so I need to start before it. Now I go down to the next level, I scan across, I see K2. K3 is greater than K2. So I know, again, the, the key I'm looking for, if it exists, which at this point I don't know whether it exists or not, is going to be on the other side of this. So whatever comes before this guy in the linked list, I can just skip entirely. So now I come across here, follow the pointer. That now I see K3 is less than K4. So again, I know that K3 has to be before this. So now I scan, scan down to the bottom, and then it's just, it's just a sequential scan along the leaf nodes to find that I want. So it's kind of, in this diagram like here, it looks like a, right, it just looks like a bunch of links on top of each other. But if you sort of visually, if you, if you can sort of rotate it in your mind, it's going to look similar to uh, like, a, like, a, like a tree data structure, right, where, we just have, we, where these things are basically the, the split points that we had before. Yes? If we start adding a lot more data, do we choose to add another layer, or are these layers like predetermined? His question is, if we start, if we start adding a lot of keys, uh, do we, do we choose to add more layers? No, you keep flipping on the coin, right? If you get 100 ones, you have to have 100 levels. I mean, I guess you, you could put a stop in there, but like, yeah, that, that's basically how it works. In the back, yes? I just want to make sure I'm understanding the answer and like flipping the coin correctly. So let's say that we flip a coin at this, that we need to put it in like two layers. Do we always like put it in the bottom layer and then the layer above it or just pick two random layers? Like His question is, uh, Going back here when I was doing the insert, as I'm flipping the coin and going up the side here, like if I flip the coin and get a, get a, get a one, I need, I need to go add, add it up here. So I know I'm, I always have to have it at the leaf node, but now I flip the coin, it tells me I'm going to add it at this node here. So you, every level as you go up, you have to add your key in. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the point of flipping the coin? What can't we deterministically decide where it should be? This question is what's the point of flipping the coin? Can you deterministically find where it should be? If you don't know the keys ahead of time, how would you know how to space out the, like, space out the levels? But you don't know how many keys are there in each level. His question, you, you don't know how many keys there are in each level? So, I mean, you, you, do know, yeah, you do know the number of keys in each level. So, no, so, so, so as soon as the dynamic data structure, I don't know the keys ahead of time. So I'm incrementally inserting them. Yeah, but, but you know how many keys are there in each level. Like, you but if you can just sort it, so without rebalancing, then you have to like, or to resort to like, yeah, if you don't if you don't rebalance, you you have to, you know, to resort everything. But flip flipping the coin gives us the randomness and gives gives us that that log n property we want. And because we don't know the keys ahead of time, this is good enough. Yes. So if you get very lucky, uh, every key is on the uh, lowest level, and just but then not, not if you're lucky, you always always have to have them on the lowest. Uh, so if you have only one key that, that you flip your coin one hundred times, and, and you have to insert into like the hundreds level, so you have a really long chain. Yes. Down. Yes. So every time you do like a like a search, you have to go down that really long chain. Then yes. It. So that that's the. So like uh, so I mean we'll see this when we talk about tries. You could vertically compress that and recognize that okay there's I have ninety uh, st you know straight pointers down with nobody else there. Then yeah you could collapse that and just keep some extra metadata. But uh, there's variants like these are called towers, I think in the original paper. Right? There's alternatives called wheels. It, 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 like, it, there's optimization you can do, obviously, yes. I'm just showing like, the vanilla skip list.
the basic idea again it's, it's like it's different than the b plus tree where we, we were deterministically deciding where, where to go this is like adding randomness to it all right let's see, quickly see how to handle deletes right so there's gonna be two steps first we're going to logically re remove the key from the index by setting a flag in 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 the record right in the entry in the, in the linked list that says hey this thing's been deleted then at some later point when we know that no one could be looking at us, which we're not really going to talk about uh, multi, or multi threading until the next class. If we know that nobody could be looking at us, then we know it's safe to go ahead and actually physically delete it and swap pointers. Again, this is easier to do if the pointers are always going one direction, so you're not worried about someone coming the other way and doing something weird. Right? So, again, now with every single entry, we're adding this little delete flag that's set to false. Right? It could be a single byte or a bit. All right, so now we want to delete K5. Again, doing the traversal algorithm, we find where K5 is. Then we go ahead and flip that bit to true, right? And then now, again, anybody that comes along that may be scanning along the leaf nodes and f finds us will encounter five, and they know to ignore it and, and just go past it. Again, the, the, the data structure at this point is, is still correct, logically. But then now when we, do, when we want to remove it, we're going to start doing it from the, the, the top going down, right? So we'll remove this, 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 this up here so no one follows follow, follow down. So again, by doing from the top going down, we know that when we start, when we actually physically remove this node, there isn't somebody coming down from above trying to, trying to grab it, right? So we're, because we're going to be deleting things as we go down. Versus like deleting from the top, then all of a sudden someone points to the node that got physically removed. So we all we do is compare and swap and change this pointer. That's good. Change that pointer. Now we're good. And then change that pointer. And now we're good, right? And again, assuming that there's no, uh, we are give, you know, keeping track of, like, is someone still looking at K5, which we'll talk about next class, right? Once we know that nobody's actually physically looking at any of these nodes, then we can go ahead and actually physically remove it, free the memory. All right, so skip lists are, uh, the advantage of a skip list is that they're going to use less memory than a B plus tree uh, because you're not, you don't have this extra space to account for new inserts showing up. And therefore, you, you know, to avoid having to split all the time. So typically, they could be using less memory as long as you don't use reverse pointers. And then we never have to do splits and merges when we delete things because it's just excising out the individual key that we want from, from, the, uh, from the data structure. If you've got to spell a disk, then this is terrible because uh, now, you're, now you're dealing with uh, reorganizing things as, as, as a sort of block structure. So instead of having a single key by itself hanging out in memory, now you got multiple keys in there. Now you got to account for that in, in how you design the, in the, in, in the, the pointers and things like that. It becomes more complicated because now your you're, you're sort of links going down are pointing to a page and you need to be aware of like, oh, that page may not have exactly that key that I'm trying to skip past and understand where, where you know, keep, there's more metadata to keep track of just scan along. And again, for the, uh, for the mem table, I, you don't scan in reverse. Uh, so this is less of an issue, but if you need to have it use this as a general data structure, a general index, where you need to be do ascending and descending uh, scans, then a skip list becomes more problematic. Okay. So going back to the B, B plus tree again, as we said before, the, the inner node are essentially guideposts that tell us whether we want to go, how we go left or right until we get to the, to the leaf node. So when we land on an inner node, at that point, we don't know anything about whether the key we're looking for actually exists or not, right? Because we could see the key in an inner node, and that tells us to go left or right. But then when we get finally down to the leaf node, we find out that it's, that it's been removed. So if you're really memory constrained and you do something really stupid, like you only have one, uh, you, know, you only have one, one, um, one frame in your buffer pool to store, store data, then you might be like doing a, a, having a buffer pool miss for every single entry as you go down, only to find out when you get, once you get to the bottom that the key that you were looking for doesn't exist. So an alternative to a B plus tree is called a tribe. And tries are actually older than B plus trees. Tries are like from 1959, invented by this, this French dude. Uh, and the B plus trees, as we said last class, was 1970-1971. And the, the interesting thing about the tries is that you're not going to store the entire key uh, at any one given node. You're actually going to break up a key into its digits. And I don't mean like a, you know Arabic numeral. I mean like sort of like one byte or one, one, you know, one, 
sort of atomic unit of, of, of the key. And we're going to store that as, uh, at, at our nodes as we go down. So to reconstruct the key, it's actually the path from the root to the leaf node that gives us back the, 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 data, the key and not the individual key itself. So like I said, these are really old. Uh, sometimes you'll see them called digital search trees or prefix trees. I think prefix trees is more common. Um, and actually, the, the term tribe means retrieval tree. And it was invented by, or the, the French guy invented the data structure. And then this guy, Edward Fenkin, coined the term try. He's actually, is or was, I think he's dead now. He's senior faculty, right? For the longest time, he was on the website of the, the faculty list. I never saw him uh, any faculty meetings, but he was still listed as being here. So the guy that coined the term was from CMU. All right, so all the operations are going to have this complexity of OK, where, uh, where K is going to be the length of the key. Because again, I may have a key that's really short, I may have a key that's really long, and depending on what key I'm looking for, that's going to tell me how many nodes I have to go look at. So we can jump through this uh, really quick, because I think everyone is familiar with, with tries. But say I have a key, hello. Again, when I want to do a lookup to see whether it exists, I follow down the, the path into my, uh, into my try. And that's going to that's going to find the key for me. So the span of the try is going to be uh, equivalent to the number of bits that we're going to use for each digit representation, right? And the as we go down, we we can start storing all the, the the different bit combinations within a byte or something, whatever we're deciding how to chunk the thing, chunk the keys. Uh, and then if we if the thing you're looking for has an entry uh, for the given key. Then you have a pointer to the next level for the next digit in the key. Otherwise, you have a null, and therefore, if you're looking down that, going down the path, you know it couldn't exist down below, and you can stop. So the span is going to determine the fan out of, of the uh, of, of each node, and it's also going to determine the height of the tree. Because again, really long keys is, is going to give me a really long tribe. So let's see a sort of really simplistic uh, uh, try with we're representing one bit. And what we're going to see is how we can lay things out in, in the data structure. And we'll see how we can apply some optimizations to actually compress it. And depending on whether the data structure is immutable or not, then some of these compression schemes will work for us. Some of these, some of these won't. So I have a one bit span try. It means every single level of my try, it's going to correspond to a single bit within our key. And again, in a real system, you wouldn't actually do it on a bit, bit by bit level like this, or one bit try. Uh, you would do typically on a byte or some larger chunk. So say I want to start keys 10, 25, and 31. So I could represent them as 16-bit uh, as integers. Again, assuming they were 32 or 64 bits, you would have the full keys, uh, ignoring bit packing optimizations, but you know, assume that's the case for, for simplicity. All right, so the data structure is going to look like this, right? where again, at every single level, there's a 0 or a 1. And if a key had its exist in our set when we, when we inserted it, uh, at, at, if they have a value for that digit, we'll have a pointer to the level below us. Right? So when we want to do a lookup, we start at the very beginning here, which is, again, the first bit offset. Again, we check to see whether the key we're looking for has a 0 or 1. In this case here, we only have zeros when we inserted it. So we have a pointer from the 0 position down to the, to the next level in the try, and the 1 we just leave as null. Right? Then we go down here, and, and for simplicity, I'm just showing this uh, repeat 10 times, because we have 10 positions in our, in our, in our bits, or sorry, in, in our integers. They're all just set to 0, right? so just repeating over and over again, having the, uh, the, the 0 bit set to a pointer, and, and, and everything else is, is null. Then we get to the next discriminator here, the first sort of discriminating uh, bit position. And now we see that for some keys, we have a 0, and we go down this path. Other keys, we have a 1, and we go down the other path. Right? And then for here, you know, we see basically it's alternating back and forth between 0, 1, 0, 1. And we have, uh, at each level, just one pointer coming out. And at the bottom, just like in, it was in the, the B plus tree, this, the bottom position would have this re uh, either record ID or a pointer to or whatever it is that we're actually the, the data structure we're pointing at. Same thing on the other side here. We have discriminating bits. And then we have a, we have a branch going below. Right. All right. So what's one optimization we can do for this to reduce the size of it? And the advantage of again, reducing the size means that there's less CPU we have to spend to do lookups on it. Yes? You can merge multiple layers if there are no, if there are only one path. Right, so he's correct. He said if, if you know that there's a single path, there's one pointer coming out of one level uh, down below it, and you see this over and over again, 
you can actually vertically compress them. You, you can compact them. Right? You know, the second one, the repeat 10, is, is an obvious example of this. What's another optimization we could do? So what, yes, yeah, sorry. Right, so you move the zeros and ones, right? So implicitly, if I'm just storing zeros and ones, it's either the first bit or the second bit. Why store zeros and ones? So I can horizontally compress each level, right? And you end up with sort of, sort of well, we did the, the horizontal compression that he proposed, uh, but then now we can also do the, the vertical compression that he proposed, and you end up with something like this. And so this is what a radix tree is. Radix tree is just a specialized form of the tri. The, think of tri as the general tri data structure, but then you can do this optimization, compress it, and you end up with what is known as a radix tree. Sometimes also called a Patricia tree. I don't know why. I don't think there was anybody named Patricia that invented it. It's just, I probably should look that up or ask ChatGPT uh, what that is, right? But we've done the vertical compression and we've done the, the horizontal compression, right? And another thing we've also done too is, going back here, uh, we actually just cut off these bottom parts of the data structure here because there's nothing, right? It's just from the, from the top to the bottom, we're just going to always end up pointing to this outbound pointer. So we cut all that off, and now we have a shorter tri. Now, this example here actually could produce false positives because I look up my tri, I follow the keys down, or you follow the bits down, and, I, and, I, and it says, yes, here's the pointer to the thing you want. But then when I follow along, then I find that the key actually isn't what I wanted. So you still have to do the extra check, like we saw in Bloom filters, where I, you know, it told me it was there, but I actually go really, if I really care, I go really verify whether it's actually there or not. Right? So tries are used oftentimes uh, to replace B plus trees or even the skip list. Like in Cassandra, they were, you know, Cassandra was using, it's a log structure merge tree. They were using skip lists, right, in the, uh, in, for the mem table. They switched to use a try. And then other ones, other, other systems replace, uh, replace a B tree entirely with, with, with tries or, or something called or the adaptive radix tree. Um, and a bunch of these systems are using that, right? So the adaptive radix tree started off in Hyper. This is a, a very influential German system uh, at a TU Munich. And then the DuckDB guys basically copied and borrowed a lot of the ideas out of Hyper. So DuckDB doesn't have a B plus tree as far as I know. It has a radix tree. And then Umbra was the follow-up to Hyper because Hyper got bought by Sales, or no, Tableau or Salesforce. No, they got bought by Tableau. And then Tableau got bought Salesforce. So you, if you run Tableau now, they have an in-memory cache. It's running Hyper. Um, they're doing something. But then Umbra is the follow-up to it. And then SolidDB and Gun, I think, are using uh, just, just Radix trees, not specifically the German try. Right? And then there's actually a commercial incarnation of Umbra called CedarDB, which, again, is just a fork of the, I think it's the fork of the, the original uh, unit code. All right, so quickly, I want to talk about how, how you actually support modifications in a try. Uh, again, there's, depending on how the data structure lay out, there's different approaches to do this. I just want to show you that like, it isn't always going to be immutable data structure, and then you can make decisions how to adapt things and, and, and merge up and down accordingly. So say I insert the key, key uh, hair into this. Again, I would follow my try down, the H, A, then I land on this node here. Assuming I have space, I can put the IR at the end and have a pointer going out to the tuple. But now if say I want, I want to delete hat, same thing. I follow the H go to the A, go to the T, find the entry that I want. I go ahead and delete this. And again, I can decide whether I want to if I just leave it there or not, all right, and, and merge it up or leave it where it is. But now let's take this here. I delete have. Then I follow that. I go ahead and delete that. And then now, according to some threshold, it isn't like the, the, the B plus tree where you say, if I'm less than half full, then I have to merge. You could just leave it, you know, you could, you could just leave it empty or having one entry there if you want. It depends on whether you're willing to pay the, uh, the, the performance penalty to do the merge. But let's see this case here. I do want to merge it. So then I just slide it up here, and I could append to the A up above, which was the only discriminating key to get me down below, and everything's still correct. Again, so we'll, tries will be used, again, in many cases where the, um, the, the oftentimes will be more compact than a B plus tree as well because you're not repeating keys over again. Like every key will only sort of exist in, in, a, in a form by itself, or on, only once. OK. So any questions about tries 
Radix trees, yes? His question is, when were the false positives? So going back here, so I have this, uh, I have this bit, you know, bit, this commercial level is coming down here. And then what I was saying is, after this discriminator, I mean, I have pointers going both directions. When I land here, it's a straight path down to the, to, to the tuple pointer, right? So in a radix tree, I would compress that, I mean, cut off that, that, branching, that path, branching path entirely. And now, up above, instead of having the pointer to the next level, I have a pointer to the tuple, right? So now someone may do a lookup on the key, what is that, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? But they might have 0, 0, and it might be 0, 0, 0, 0 for like four zeros, or three zeros, and then a 1. And both, both of those keys is always going to land out in, on this pointer here. So when I go then look at the tuple, I got to go see whether the key actually really does exist. Yes, so, so in this example here, you would only match the prefix of the key. And that might be OK, right? It depends. Again, it's classic compute versus storage trade-off. OK. So we finished up in, in uh, 20 minutes. Good. All right, so in. All the indexes we talked about so far, you can use them for point queries or range queries. Point queries is like, give me a single key and you know, tell me whether it exists or not, or get the, get the tuple. Right? Find me all the customers that have you know, the zip code 1527. Could be a, a producing multiple tuples or single, but the idea is like you have one key discriminator and you're looking it up. And it's also used for range queries. So find me all the orders within some, some kind of date range. But they're not good if you want to do keyword searches, where you actually want to look at the contents, the inside of a attribute's value, and look at sort of a portion of it, rather than the entire thing. Right? If, I have a, if I have a column on, on for zip codes that I'm doing my, my first lookup on, it's the only thing in that column is going to be the zip code. But if I'm storing, say, all the Wikipedia articles that exist in my database, and I want to find all the articles where the, the word Pablo is in it, then all these data structures we talked about before aren't going to be good. Because how would it work, right? I would have to take the, the, the content field and build an index on that. That doesn't make any sense. right? Because, I, again, I want, to, I want a portion of it. Right? So going back here, again, assuming this is a, is a small mock-up of, the, the, um, of what the Wikipedia schema looks like, if I build a B plus three index on revisions on content, then I can't really use it to do... Uh, a predicate like this, find me all the content where wildcard, Pablo, wildcard exists. Right? Because it's, it's going to, it can't use the index because to do that traversal down in my B plus tree, I have to have the entire key. Right? Actually, this query actually won't work either. It's actually technically incorrect as well because it's going to find wildcard, Pablo, wildcard, meaning like if there's, if there's like another character at the end of Pablo, it'll, it'll match that like that Russian scientist Pavlov, right? So actually, this query also won't work either, because I actually found out yesterday they removed the, the Wikipedia article about me on Wikipedia. And the reason I found out is that I got some spam email from some guy trying to get money out of me to get, me, to, to get the Andy, Andy Pavlov article back on of Wikipedia. Uh, so anyway, it's a scam. I'm not giving him money. Anyway, so I'm not on Wikipedia anymore. So this is what an inverted index is going to solve for us, right? Sometimes called a full text search index. Right? The idea is that we're going to have a mapping of the, of the we'll call it terms, or the, the sub-elements of a, of, a, of a value in our, in, our, in, our, in our tuple for a given attribute. And now we can do those partial lookups we want to do is find all the entries where this thing matches, all right? This is originally called, before computing, was called concordance, right? This has to do with, like, they would have people in the old days literally read books and find, basically build the glossary. Find me all the pages where this thing exists. Like some, some guy did it in the 1200s uh, in Europe where he had 500 monks read the Bible and build basically a full text search index, right? So many of the major data systems that you care about will have some flavor of a full text index or inverted index that we'll talk about. Um, 
But the, the more specialized ones, there are more specialized libraries out there uh, in, in data systems that are going to be actually way better than what the uh, what like Postgres will give you or what the other systems will give you. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So basically what the inverted index is going to look like is there's going to be two, two pieces. There's the dictionary and the posting list. So the dictionary is basically a, a, all the extracted terms, if you want to call it that. Right? It doesn't have to be words. It could be other elements of, of, a, of a value. Right? There'll be a dictionary that's going to maintain all the terms and then the frequency in which those terms exist. And then they'll just have a pointer to uh, a posting list where every single term, here's all the record IDs where this, this term exists. Right? So, so in my example here, right, there's three articles about, that mention the word Carnegie. Right? And so I, I have my, my frequency is set to three, and my posting list has the, the record IDs or whatever it is, the unique identifier for those three entries. So now when I want to say, go find me all the articles where you know, the, the term Wu-Tang appears, I would check this. That's a quick lookup. We'll talk about how we, how we find that in a second. I find my dictionary. I get my pointer to my posting list. And now I can immediately jump to exactly those, those records that have the value that I want. Versus having to do a sequential scan and look at all the the values and basically split the strings or parse through it to try to find the thing you're looking for. Right? You're, you're pre-computing this index. So as I said, there's a bunch of libraries that provide uh, these data structures. The most well-known one is this thing called Lucene. Right? It's written in Java. There's a one in C++ called uh, Zapien. And then the new one is this Tant Tantibi, uh, which is not written in Rust. Think of like Lucene, but in Rust. And we'll have people coming to talk about how they use that. Actually, I think next week, the PreDB guys use this. Um, and then, it's, again, it's going to provide the dictionary and, and the posting list stuff we'll talk about. Uh, I'll show you in the next slide. And then there's a bunch of systems that take these, uh, these, these you know, uh, inverted index libraries and build larger DB systems around them. The most well-known one is Elasticsearch. Uh, Sol it uses Lucene. Solar uses Lucene. I think Sphinx does as well. Uh, OpenSearch is Amazon's fork of Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch changes their license uh, to make it less friendly for cloud vendors. So they did a hard fork. Uh, Elasticsearch didn't realize that was a mistake and switched back their license like two weeks ago. But by then, OpenSearch is kind of uh, rising in prominence. Um, so anyway, but they, at, at, at their core, they're both just using Lucene and have like a sort of friendly, nice interface and other features around it. And then that's what Splunk is actually, Splunk is much older than all these. Splunk is very expensive, and that's, like, that's very common in the enterprise world. I think Cisco just bought them this summer. All right, so let's talk about roughly what Lucene looks like, and then we'll talk about what Postgres looks like for these, uh, um, you know, for these run index. So for Lucene, the way they're going to organize their dictionary is through this FST, or finite state tra transducer. And it's going to look almost like a try, where it's going to sort of break up the key into individual digits. But instead of having at the, like, the leaf node, of the, tr of the data structure, the pointer to where I need to go, actually, the, the, the weights on the edges in my data structure, it's going to tell me how to compute the offset to where I need to go. That's a neat little trick. And they're basically going to increment, they're going to incrementally create dictionaries for individual records as they're inserted into the, uh, into the, in, into the, the database so that it's sort of each dictionary is localized to some, some subset of the documents. Then in the background, they're going to do like almost the compaction stuff we saw in the log structure merge tree, where they're going to start combining the segments together to make larger uh, dictionaries and reduce the redundancy, reduce the you know, rep repeated values in the, in the dictionaries. So say that in our dictionary, we have uh, four keys, br, brav, pov, and, and pla. And so the finite transducer will look like this, where I'm going to, again, break up the digits and then each edge is going to have a weight that's going to tell us how we get to, to the bottom here. So now if I want to do a lookup, like find PAV, as I traverse into my data structure, I'll keep a rolling tally of the, the offset of, based on the weights as I compute them. And then when I'm done, I, you know, I hit a terminating node in black here. That's going to tell me, OK, where I'm at now, I need to go look at uh, you know, look up, and that's going to tell me how to get where I need to go. All right, so first, first, uh, first character in PAV is P. So we land here, and now our, our update, I'll set, that should be two, not three, sorry. Right? Then we follow this weight down here, updates by one, that should be three. Um, and then this weight here, you can have weights of zero. That gives us uh, three, we would jump to that offset there. 
right? I'm off by one down there. So this is like a different form of a try, and because it's immutable, we're not worried about maintaining this all, all on the fly. We would, we would have all the keys and the offsets ahead of time because the, the dictionary is going to be sorted. Other interesting thing is that they're, they're going to use all the same te techniques for compressing things that we talked about before because you're going to have this, these immutable data structures and a bunch of the bits or the, the values we all laid out almost in, like column, in a column order. Like the posting list is just a, a column of, 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 of integers. So they can do delta compression, they can do bit packing, they can do all the things that we saw before with column stores. Lucene can also do some extra stuff like pre compute aggregations for terms like rolling counts and things like that. So now when you do a lookup, like count the number of times a, a given term exists in all my values, right, I could just go through that frequency list uh, very quickly. And they have a pre compute, they can pre compute one so, so you don't have to look at every single segment separately. So the Lucene is widely used and, it, and it's, it's pretty well optimized at this point. So let's see what Postgres does. So Postgres has this thing called the GIN, the Generalized Inverted Index. And essentially, the, the data structure they're going to use is going to be a forest of trees. So they're going to use a B plus tree for the terms, the dictionary, and then the values in the, or the, you know, the keys are the terms, right, and, and it'll be the entire keys. Again, we're not trying to store the entire you know, Wikipedia article. We're breaking it up into, uh, in, in, you know, into terms and then storing that. So then the values of this initial dictionary B plus tree will vary depending on the number of records that uh, correspond in the posting list. So if you have a small number of, of records, a few number of records, then the posting, the posting list is just going to be a, a sorted array right? that's just sitting in some page. That's fine. But if you have a lot, so you can set a threshold to say, if my posting list grows to this size, then they stop appending to this really long list. Because now if you, if, you have, if you have to find you know, individual records, you, know, you don't have to do, you don't have to do sequential scan or binary search on this. They instead will then create another B plus tree that just has the, it just has the, 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 the record IDs. Also similar to, we saw in, um, in last class we saw the, the, the B epsilon tree, right, where they had this mod log at every single node to absorb all the writes. They recognized that if I do an insert into a, into a table where I have one of these uh, inverted indexes on, say I have, you know, it's a, it's a, a large Wikipedia article, I got to break it up on all the terms, and I, then I have to insert all those entries into my, into my dictionary. And now I'm doing all the splits stuff that we talked about last class, and that could be expensive. So instead what they'll do is they'll have this mod log on the side called the pending list. They insert all the pending updates into that. And then occasionally when, when this thing gets full, then they'll, they'll, do, uh, they'll do a compaction and apply all the changes into the dictionary. And you can do that bulk insert we saw before, where you sort the things ahead of time and sort of build things from, from the bottom up. So when I'm going to do a lookup now, I got to first check the pending list, like we did in, you know, in the mem table, check, see whether the thing I'm looking for is in there. And then if it's, if it's not, then I got to switch over to the, the full dictionary. All right, it depends on what the, what the query is. Again, this solved a different problem than, than the B plus tree. Right, and these other indexes, because we're not trying to do, again, the point queries. We're trying to find, find the things that have this, the contents that I'm looking for. I'm not going to talk about this. There's a whole other class at CMU that does, talks about you know, text searching and full text index, indexes. But the, like the things like Lucene and Elasticsearch have a bunch of other stuff that, uh, that go beyond what we talk about here. Like they know how to break up, uh, break up um, to, to normalize the, 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 the data you're storing in it so that you have match, you can do fuzzy matches. So for example, if I have like Wu-Tang with a hyphen without a hyphen, uh, you can have your full text, index, full text index or inverted index recognize that these things are actually really the same. So if you see one, you know it should map to the other. Or say like USA with, with the dots, without the dots, those things should be, should be equivalent based on the semantics of language. And therefore, they know how to handle those things. Like, so they're not just really just taking the raw words they're not splitting on strings. They're, they're doing a bunch of other tricks, right? Or they can throw away common words like the, to, no, yes, things like that. So inverted indexes are all about searching data based on its contents. Again, as I said, you, you can be a little bit fuzzy about the, 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 what characters are in a word and whether they match or not. But at a high level, you're just trying to see, does this thing exist in my, in my data? But sometimes you want to search on the semantics or the higher level meaning 
of what's in the data. And if you're just looking for keywords or the terms, you, you can't do that. Right? So instead of just finding all the, the records with the the words Wu-Tang, say I want to find all the, the records where there's lyrics about hip hop groups, you know, slinging rocks. Well, what, what does that even mean? Like the, the data center doesn't know what slinging rocks means, doesn't know how to map that to a certain activity. Uh, so if you try to do a key, exact keyword search on inverted index, this will produce nothing. So this is where the vector indexes come in. And I sort of mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the semester. But the idea is that we want to we want to rely on these embeddings that we can generate through transformers, like things like opening eyes in the working one or the, the BERT from, from Google, that know how to take sort of arbitrary text or wh whatever data we want to store, and then it spits out these floating point arrays, arrays of floating point numbers, where somehow embedded in those those numbers is a higher level meaning or deeper meaning of our data. And then now when we do lookups like, you know, you know, my example of like trying to find, find all the, the, the lyrics where they're slinging rocks, it somehow knows what slinging rocks means, knows that there's a bunch of lyrics talking about similar activities, and therefore those, those embeddings should, should somehow match. But it's never going to be an exact match, and so we have to rely on nearest neighbor search or approximate nearest neighbor search. Right? Find me the embeddings that are close to my embedding. Because somehow that they're, they're, somehow they're, they're, they're meaning. They're, somehow they're similar to each other. So this is going to be really different than all the queries we've seen before because there isn't going to be an exact correct answer. Because you don't know what the embedding actually is producing. Right? It's not meant to be decipherable by humans. And so when a query comes back with an answer, there's no magic oracle you can say, yes, this is, I know for a fact that this is the right answer. Right? Think of like I have, I have billions of records how would I know within that billion that like, the, the thing I'm getting back is exactly what I want? Right? So it ends up being like what feels right, what feels correct. So there's a bunch of these vector databases that are out there that have vector indexes. I'm actually showing the, the vector database specific ones. But as I said before, a lot of the uh, relational database systems have their own flavors of these vector indexes. And they're standalone libraries that everybody's incorporating uh, that, are, that are built by other people. So I want to talk about the, the sort of the two basic approaches to this, the, the, the inverted file ones and then the, the, the small worlds. And I, I'll just talk at a high level how to do this. Uh, again, there's other classes that, that teach us, but we, we care about how we actually incorporate this in our, in our database system. And one of the big challenges that the vector index uh, you have to face is that the vector index will be lookups on the embedding, but oftentimes I want to have additional predicates in my where clause that aren't going to be captured by the embedding. Right, find me all the, the lyrics where they're talking about slinging rocks and was written after 2015. 2015 isn't going to be in the embedding. That's going to be an additional attribute. So now I have to decide, do I want to filter on 2015 first, uh, then do my uh, nearest neighbor lookup on the, on the vector, or should I just get a bunch of vectors and then iteratively check to see whether they're, you know, the, the year is greater than 2015, which make me, means I have to keep going back and if I don't have enough answers, right, if I'm throwing away too many things. So this is what the, the, the Pinecone guys and Weaviate guys claim they, they have, have solved. It's not clear. The Weaviate guys are more vocal about what they're doing. They're basically, you'll, you'll, I mean, when we talk about the, 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 the graph structure, the, the small worlds, they can store the metadata in the nodes as well. So like, you don't have to go back and look at a separate index and look up. All right, so the most basic one is do an inver inverted file. The most common one is this IV, IVF flat. And the idea is that you're basically going to take your, your vectors Break them up to smaller groups using some kind of clustering algorithm like k-means. Pick your favorite one. And then the idea is that when I want to do a, a lookup to see, find me the nearest neighbors for my, my lookup vector uh, or embedding, then I would land in some group and then just look around me to find the entries that, that are close to me. Right? So you would take your, say this is our vector space, and we're plotting it down in two dimensions. And then we use whatever k-means clustering algorithm we want to put them in groups. Right, and then we have all the other vectors are hanging near the, the centroids for all of them. So now when, I, when a query comes along and it gives me, gives me a vector, right, I would land in some kind of space like this, and I could just check whatever the, in, in the, the group that I'm looking at, just sequentially scan through to find the, um, find, find the, the nearest neighbors. I may want to check other nearby groups because maybe that'll improve my accuracy. Right? I could build an index or do other preprocessing, like quantizing, the, 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 the vectors as I'm storing it, 
Right, I still I still want to keep the original ones, but in this vector index, I'll, I'll quantize them to be lower dimensions so that my lookups are faster and without re reducing accuracy. But it's a really simple divide and conquer approach, right? I just do this 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 clustering to land in some space where I know the data that I want should be close to me. The other approach is to do navigatable small worlds. I'll show the the single one, the sort of single level, but you basically can extend this through multiple levels. Again, I think another class covers all this kind of stuff. But the idea is that we're going to have a graph structure where we would have, we would specify how many edges we want coming out of the nodes that is going to correspond to its nearest neighbors. And then we have some entry point into our data structure that tells us where, if we want to do a search, where do we start? And then we just follow along the path in, in this graph, choosing a path that gets us closer to where our, our target vector is. So say our, 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 our query has some, some, some embedding. Right, and that lands us in the space here. So to find the nearest neighbors, we start at the entry point, and this, then again, just follow along the path and find all the things that get us closer. And then at some point, we'll get to a node where we can't get any closer, and therefore our search stops. And then we can have multiple levels below this if we want to have additional things. So I think uh, Facebook's FAST is probably the most well-known one of these uh, that's actually worked on. And then I think the original authors have this HNSW lib uh, Lib, uh, lib library you can potentially use as well. But a lot, again, a lot of relational database systems are using a fast one. I think Pinecone actually uses fast as well. OK? So finish up. So we're going to see filters again, as I said, multiple times throughout the semester. B plus trees are almost always going to be the de de default choice still, over tries, over radix trees, over, uh, or definitely over skip lists. Um, and as I said, the inverted index will go more details in, in uh, I think this is in LTI 1142. Like they cover how to do the tokenizer. They cover how to do all the, the language modeling stuff. All that is, is in that course. There's a whole other category of data structures we didn't talk about, these multidimensional data structures. Things like R trees, quad trees, KD trees. Think of like geospatial things. Like if I have a, a two-dimensional space, how do I know my point's going to land? If I have a given point, what, what, you know, what polygon does it land in? Right? Oftentimes, they, this is how they basically do lookups like find me, uh, you know, find me shortest path and things like that in, 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 mapping, um, in mapping systems. So that's covered in 15.826 multimedia uh, databases, and that's called, taught by uh, Christos Flusas, which I, I think you know, I know he's teaching it this semester. He may not be teaching it next semester. But again, there's all these other data structures that do, uh, can handle multidimensional data much better than a you know, regular B plus G that we talked about. Okay. All right. So we'll switch over now to do the, the talk from TidyB. But next class will be how do we actually make our, our indexes thread safe, which is something we've been glossing over entirely throughout the entire semester. Uh, but now, now, now we'll actually understand like, how that all works. Okay. Let's see. Sonny, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm right. I'm here. Okay, I gotta turn up. There we go. All right, Sonny, now say something. Sorry? There we go. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. All right, one I second. Can. Let me make this full screen and slide you over. Are you, do you have an interest slide, or can I say how awesome you are on my own? There must be something wrong with my audio. I couldn't hear that. All right, let me, uh, let me check what, let me see what mic I'm on. One sec. Uh, let's do, let's do, is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So the okay. echo's gone, yes. All right, hold on. Let me do, well, you can't see the class, but I'll do, you can look at me if you want. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Uh, this is, oh, let me turn up the recording. This is all correct. So this is Sonny. Um, he used to run MySQL for 20 years. He knows everything about MySQL, but he's not at MySQL anymore. He's with uh, TidyB. So Sonny, the floor is yours. Go for it. OK, so this is a high-level view of TidyB. And if there's one thing that I want you know, people to take away from this is how does TidyB handle scale and what the core idea is. And the rest, I think you should be able to figure out. So, uh, so what are the data growth trends? Just I'll quickly go over all this, a brief history of how TIDB came about, what problem it's trying to solve, the general architecture, and what we're trying to do next. 
So these are the people that use TiDB. So it's used by all the major companies and by banks. It's like a general purpose database that can handle petabytes of data. So I'll just so this is roughly the way the data is growing every year. I stole this from some site that obviously gives statistics. And as you can see, I mean, it's just getting out of control. So this, this is the problem that IDB is trying to solve. And if you look at 2014, that's when the founders of IDB were working for a company that was growing very quickly. And then the data wasn't growing as much, but it still was quite a lot. So it was the best of times, worst of times, business was growing, but Handling that data that was coming in was becoming a huge problem. And there were hundreds of terabytes, and the only solution in those days was manual sharding and resharding, and it used to take forever. Weekends were short, and so it was pretty bad. And keeping consistency across shards was a very difficult problem because all they had was MySQL replication at that time. And so then they discovered Spanner. So Spanner came up with this idea that you split the data into chunks and then you uh, move it around and you have some kind of access or some kind of consistency protocol over it. I won't go over this. I'm sure you can read it from the Google Spanner paper. But Spanner was proprietary and not open source and special hardware is required to run Spanner. And the founders of TiDB wanted to run this on commodity hardware and uh, on standard SQL and not some custom SQL with some custom protocol. They wanted to support MySQL because that was very popular. It's still quite popular. I think the second most or the, the most popular open source database anyway. So they decided to go with the MySQL protocol. So this is the core TIDB design philosophy. It's shared nothing architecture. Developers should not be concerned with chart details. Developers should not have the should have the flexibility to control data placement. So TiDB also, it does it automatically, but it also gives you SQL to do placement on a rack, on a particular host, or the data center region, those sort of things. As I said earlier, standard SQL, and uh, you should not have to have any specialized interface. And in order to support the distributed model of data that uh, Spanner sort of came up with and TiDB implements, uh, we need to provide strong transactional consistency guarantees out of the box so that it's easy to reason about the system. And flexible read consistency policy policies should be provided. It is highly available, but not at the cost of strong consistency. So consistency is extremely important. It just makes it easier for people to reason about things and uh, reduces the risk and corruption and those sort of things. Because these are like, hard, really difficult to deal with in the production uh, system. So this is the general architecture. So you have a, a metadata server. Those are the PD cluster. PD is as a uh, placement driver, but it's really a metadata uh, process. And there's a cluster of them. It's managed, uh, the state is managed through. The PD instances themselves don't have any state. They're all stateless. Uh, and the TIDB nodes that in red are also stateless. The state is all in the storage cluster also there's an etcd uh, instance running uh, with the P pd where the pd state is stored so pd is really the brains behind tikv so if for example a query comes into tidv the front end sql nodes the ones in red it has to ask pd where is this uh, region or tablet located and so it tells it that's the address you go to such and such host and that's where the current leader of the raft group is and you can read the data from there so this allows for distributed execution of uh, SQL queries. So let's say a query spread out across N shards or regions or tablets, whatever you want to call them. It can issue a request in parallel to the different IKV, this blue, the blue nodes that you see there. Additionally, it has an optional component called tie flash. So this is a column format version of the same data. It's a copy of the data. They do not participate in the raft election. That's the only thing. They're just... Uh, learner nodes they just read the data from the raft the raft messages from the log and convert it into a column store and that's and tidb can the optimizer can even send sub queries to the column store in case it makes more sense to do an aggregation or a file scan or whatever on the column store so this is the high level thing so what is this thing mysterious thing called region Oh, hang on. First, we'll go to TIKV. So TIKV, you can think of it as a RocksDB, uh, distributed RocksDB. And so it has an AP, a key value API. It has a transaction model, which is Percolator. It's a modified version of Percolator, which also comes from Google. And it uses Raft to distribute 
the regions and underneath is one instance of RocksDB per Thai KV. And there's a thing called a co-processor. So this is used internally for query pushdown. I won't go into the details of that, but it's essentially uh, aggregation scans and those sort of things can be pushed down so that they are processed closer to the physical data and reduces network traffic. And then they send the summary back to the SQL nodes and then they, the node that issued the request can then collect them all and send the result back to the client. So that's the idea. So just to give you an example, so imagine you have a very large, your, your entire database is composed of one table. Just, that's the way to uh, imagine it in an abstract sense. And there is some special encoding of the key that allows you to separate tables, indexes, and whatnot. And imagine you can, uh, each of those, uh, that entire table is chunked up into the regions, which are uh, by default 96 megabytes. It can be changed, but that's what they are. So imagine, and, and they're all ordered. And imagine your data is ordered and you can chop it up. And each of those individual regions is a separate raft group. And those regions are spread out across your Thai KV cluster. So if you look at this, uh, like those disk type things, you'll see there'll be, uh, I hope you can see the arrows. So the, there are arrows pointing from uh, region two to one or region uh, three to one. So all that means is that where the arrows actually, uh, like region one would be the leader region. So that's where the current data is. It's quite possible that if the data has only been synced to region one, and region, uh, like the first and the second, the leader and one follower and the third one is still in the process because that's all that the consensus protocol really requires. So Thai KB will always read from the leader. It always gives you consistent data. In theory, you can read from uh, the other regions, but we don't do it simply because uh, it's better to be correct than to be fast, faster. So, so if you understand this, you'll more or less understand how Thai KB's storage is scaled out. It just chunks it up uses raft per chunk to spread the data around and PD monitors the health of all these nodes and PD is the one that knows where the data is actually located. So that's the that's why it's called the placement driver. And it also monitors the hotspots. It monitors how much RAM is being used, how much IO is being used, uh, how much free space there is, uh, all kinds of metrics. And then it will also rebalance to so that the load is spread evenly across a cluster. Not all your machines have to be the same size, so it has to or have the same amount of capacity. So it has to use all this information to cleverly uh, place uh, or move data around. If there's a one of the nodes goes down, then it does an election over uh, the regions that were the leaders on that region. So that is all localized to a region. The rest of the cluster can keep going if th that uh, if those regions are not being accessed by anybody. So that's how basically it works. So a region is TyKV's logical scale unit. So load balance, scale out, scale in are all balanced on regions. So if a region shrinks, I mean, you delete some data, it can uh, merge the regions and go back to whatever its previous state was. So they are, as I said, you know, they're replicated using the raft consensus protocol and it, each region is a separate raft group. That's why we call it multi-raft and they spread, uh, spread all across the cluster. And a single node can contain many regions, and regions are stored in RocksDB, and there is one RocksDB per node. So, and rows are the key point is the rows in a region are ordered. We don't support hash partitioning. So, the distributed transactions in TiDB are based on uh, percolator. So, it supports supports read committed and snapshot isolation, and the snapshot isolation because it's uh, supports the MySQL protocol it's mapped to InnoDB's repeatable read. There are some minor differences, but we can we won't go over them now. And a transaction require like it requires a start timestamp when it started, when it ended. So it's required for MVCC. And the component that is responsible for handing out these timestamps is the placement driver, which is why I said it's a metadata server. It does more than one job. So TiDB supports async commit. And in this, it uses two-phase commit. And in this, it uses the SQL nodes, the front-end SQL nodes, which are stateless otherwise. They actually, in reality, they have a little bit of state to optimize the front distributed transactions, actually. Uh, but it's not like a permanent, so if it goes, it goes. But it does have, they do try and store some state. Some state. Um, the TyKV nodes are the participants in the two-phase commit. And 
It works extremely well when the transaction write set is small and phase two time dominate. So phase two in this case would be, so you've sent out what you want to do. And it's, uh, let's say these are the, the first phase would be notifying all the changes you want to make. And the second phase is when you, you get the, uh, a, the act back saying that, yep, we can handle the second phase. And so then it sends all the data that needs to be sent uh, to all the different nodes and passed around. So all this is handled through the raft log actually. So if you only modify one region or you insert a record without a secondary index because it would go to a second region, or it can do all this in a single one phase commit. So if, if your writes are small and they only touch one region, let's say small batches, or with that fit within a page, it can do single phase commit. Basically the raft log you write to it once and the raft log is your uh, point that guarantees uh, durability. But it's nothing is perfect. So as I said, the data is growing massively. So how do you improve stability at scale? Copying data, so you add a new node, moving data around it becomes expensive. Before that node can start serving requests and before the data can be moved, it can take a long time, depending on the size of the node and your data. Compaction within LSM trees is a huge problem. And because there's one LSM and if your data is huge, uh, it can become a big pain, a really big pain. So how do you solve all these problems? So data volume is huge now. We have customers asking for 200 petabyte clusters. I mean, this is, in my mind, it's ridiculous, but it's, that's what people are asking. Multiple, so people also want to reduce cost. They want to share a single cluster across multiple applications. Otherwise the complexity of managing things and the cost also goes up. So you want to take the maintenance burden of a distributed, distributed systems are difficult to manage. So you want, and also trade-offs that you made in the design of your system, they become knobs that you have to constantly tune and fiddle with to balance your system manually. So it is, it, it just adds to the complexity. So you also want to scale down when the workload reduces. So when you provision your system uh, and you do capacity planning, people obviously plan for peak traffic, but you don't get peak traffic all the time. Maybe like you know, the, these you know, sales are, like uh, this Black Friday sale or some other gimmicky sale thing that they have. So the traffic will peak, but most of the time it's low and you don't want to pay for all those instances. So you want it to be elastic in the true sense. So you want it to scale down and only pay for, let's say if your instances are quotient, so you only want to pay for storage cost, not for all the networking and everything else that goes with it. So that's like the ideal. So we wanted to leverage the cloud infrastructure so that a developer can start small and scale to any size. So one of the things you want to do, which is one of the cheapest things, at least on AWS, is S3. And S3, the, it, the costing is very interesting. The amount of data you send it is not such a big deal. It's the number of requests that you make. So if you have your database doing sending every request to S3, it becomes extremely expensive. But the size of the data is not such a big deal. So you have to balance these two things. So you want to leverage that for elasticity and resilience. S3 is very resilient. It is actually a fantastic system. And you want to leverage that. And other things in the cloud too, but in our case, let's say storage is like a very big thing. And you also want to hide the complexity. So you don't want people, I mean, you just want people to connect to a point, run the queries and it should scale automatically. It should scale down automatically. And you shouldn't have to worry about any of that stuff. And you want to integrate like a regular, should be like a regular database and work with other uh, services. And like I said earlier, the only cost of a question instance should be storage and nothing else. I, I, so we came I, up with this I, thing Sonny, called- Sonny, we're, we're out of time. You want to show, show one last slide? Oh, okay. I'll just show this slide. This is a new storage engine. That's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, time for one question. So you showed a slide that said 200 petabytes. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of data. Who has that kind of data? I mean, not you guys. I mean, like, what, what, what organization in the world has 200 petabytes of data? Think like for acronyms and F They keep everything. Sonny can't say it, but I'll say it. Right? Right? The has that kind of data. It's a lot. It's hard. Right? And so, uh, 
I'll say one, I'll, one more thing else too. Sonny said TidyB started in 2014. The rule of thumb, it takes 10 years before your database actually becomes good and useful and safe. It's 2024. It's 10 years. All right, do the math. All right, so let's give Sonny a round of applause. Thank you. All right, again, so uh, if you have not started Project One, that's a huge problem. It is due this Sunday. If you're struggling in Project One, that's a big problem too. Do something. <laughs> Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. Then I'm in flight. We ignite, blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl run me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives.